Chasing Leviathan is a podcast about pursuing truth, one big question at a time through the discipline of listening. Truth is too big to tame. But if we pay close attention, we might get the chance to glimpse something truly magnificent. So please join me in this pursuit, one week at a time. Hello and welcome to Chasing Leviathan. I'm here today with Dr. Paul Moser, Professor of Philosophy at the Loyola University of Chicago. And um, this is the point where I'd normally show the book, but I got it on Kindle, so here's my Kindle. Uh, The book we're talking about today is uh, Divine Guidance uh, from the Elements and the Problems of God series uh, from Cambridge University Press. Dr. Moser, wonderful to have you today. Thank you, PJ. And so uh, kind of as we just get started, I know that you have a kind of long and uh, storied career in uh, this, these kind of areas, but uh, tell us a little bit why this book in particular. Ever since I was about uh, 15 years old, I've been uh, haunted by the question of what would uh, evidence of God look like? Hmm. because. Um, I had evidence uh, from religious experience, but I still wanted to know what the heart of that was, what that religious experience included that made it evidence of God, in particular, uh, a God worthy of worship. And so I um, started looking for uh, an answer to the question of, Uh, What would evidence of God look like uh, if it's indeed evidence of God? Hmm. Well, you naturally look to what various theologians and philosophers have said. And so that led me into um, taking up uh, philosophy uh, in college and then graduate school with the uh, common and enduring uh, background question of what would evidence of God actually be? And in addition, do we have such evidence? Well, <clears throat> since I'm fairly slow, it took me a long time <laughs> to put some of the pieces of the puzzle together. And uh, they've come together, shall we say, piecemeal. And um, I tried to um, crystallize uh, some of the key views in this book on divine guidance. Because in the end, uh, I think that a God worthy of worship would want to be a good Lord over humans. And lordship there means leadership. And so you're now at the uh, door of guidance because leadership, as I understand it, would be uncoerced guidance. Mm. And this is echoed, I think, uh, throughout uh, not only the Psalms, but parts of the New Testament. Indeed, Paul says at one point that um, those who are children of God are those who are led or guided by God. Well, what's this leading, guiding stuff? Uh, It's widely neglected at least in the academic theology and philosophy literature, including philosophy of religion. So I figured, well, maybe this is something crucial that's been overlooked. And uh, I would say that it is indeed. And the Divine Guidance book is an effort to spell out what it would be for God to offer evidence of God toward the end of guiding people. And I claim now that um, what God would want above all is moral rapport with people, where moral rapport is similar to what Paul calls communion of God in 2 Corinthians. Um, Sometimes the word fellowship is used, but I like the word rapport because um, 
It suggests interaction and interpersonal interaction at that. And so I claim the heart of the evidence we need for God is not the abstract stuff of natural theology, the first cause arguments, the design arguments, the fine-tuning arguments, ontological. I claim that's all too abstract for the kind of God uh, who was sought by Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Paul. I claim that God is one who would want to guide people as their Lord with whom they have what I call moral rapport. I definitely feel like I can understand the rapport part of that. Um, can you comment a little bit on uh, why you're adding moral to that? Is that just that it is good or that it has to do with the moral dimension? Because I remember you referenced Buber um, uh, somewhere in here talking about not losing, um, that God is not only the ethical dimension. Yes, that's a key question. And the answer comes in what I claim uh, is a word central to all of the important biblical narratives. And that word is righteousness. Hmm. God is continually uh, described as righteous throughout the Hebrew Bible and uh, in the central writings of the New Testament. It's God's righteousness that distinguishes God, makes God unique. And lo and behold, it's what God wants to show and enact through humans. Ezekiel says, Isaiah suggests as much, and Paul talks about the righteousness um, of God in Christ in us, in the followers. And so I claim that God would have uh, at the heart of any kind of communion with uh, humans, any kind of fellowship, the maintenance and promotion of God's unique character of divine righteousness. Now, um, I think that's what morality uh, for the biblical accounts is all about, namely bringing divine righteousness into the life of wayward humans. And the big question becomes, how do you get that? And of course, uh, the biblical writers are quite astute on this, uh, beginning with uh, Genesis 3, where uh, Adam and Eve are portrayed as having a problem with God because they think God is withholding something good from them. Indeed, mm -hmm. including making one wise, Genesis 3 says that, that Eve thought that um, eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil would make one wise. Well, as if God had failed on that front. In other words, the way to become wise is to disobey God. Mm -hmm. That's the gist of what Eve is saying in uh, Genesis 3. And then God has to do something to challenge this nonsense. And so God sets up the fiery protection uh, for the uh, tree, of the, uh, tree of life and says, you know, you people have to have a break from this setting, but I need to protect people coming to uh, this uh, completely valuable knowledge by the wrong means, mm. not by the means of even Adam, but by the right means. And you get a story about this when you get to Abraham, because there God reckons righteousness to Abraham by what? Not by his creating his own way of wisdom, not by following Eve, but as Paul says in Romans 4, and as Genesis says, he trusted God. Mm. He didn't distrust. He didn't say, oh, maybe God is withholding something good. And so, in other words, Eve sides with the serpent in distrusting God. Abraham starts the renewal by saying, God, even though I have no idea how you're going to work this out, in fact, it's laughable, I'm still going to trust you. 
And so that notion of righteousness participating in God's character becomes the very heart of what the biblical goal is. And when you get to Matthew's gospel, representing Jesus, righteousness is all over it. Right. Seek first the kingdom and its righteousness. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, forget about it. And so, again, and Paul is just all over this in Romans, right? The whole thing is about righteousness and how you get it and how you don't. And so what I'm claiming is that's at the heart of rapport because it's in that righteousness that you have what's called life with God. That's where life with God is. And in addition, and here's what a lot of people miss, that's also where evidence for God's reality and goodness uh, is in that righteousness. And so the question is, well, where do you find that? That's a nice talk. It sounds uh, kind of uplifting and all that, but it's just so much talk. And I want to say, wait a minute. It's not. If we reflect properly, we find something called the battleground of the conscience. That's what I call it in the guidance book. That where God is at work um, most clearly uh, in humans and trying to work as they frustrate them, as they suppress the truth, is in what we call conscience. And of course, it's the best thing we suppress. We suppress it constantly. We try to push it away. We're too busy for it. I claim that that's where the uh, most salient evidence of God is to be found outside Jesus, outside the life of Jesus. And Paul confirms this in Romans 5, where he says, uh, hoping and believing in God, they don't disappoint us. They don't leave us ashamed or embarrassed because God's agape has been poured out into our heart through the Holy Spirit, where heart for Paul includes conscience. Uh, that's what Paul uh, is trying to point to here, that within us. And Paul can even say in Romans 9 that what I'm testifying to is confirmed um, in conscience by the Spirit of God. And so Paul thinks of this thing that we call the conscience as loaded with God's activity to nudge us toward becoming uh, the children of God and entering into what he calls the glory of the freedom of the children of God. Which can only come through that liberation of conscience. That's right. right. That God remakes the conscience by coming to it. But here's the hitch. He doesn't make us manipulated pawns. We have to cooperate. Now, here's where a lot of uh, people have been frightened in the past. Wait a minute. Cooperate? Are you bringing in a work? Are you saying in the end then that it's by works? This is just the biggest distortion you can find in theology, that somehow obedience is a work in Paul's technical sense. Hmm. In Romans 4, Paul tells us what this technical sense of work is, and it's an earning. It's, it's something that would make God indebted or obligated to redeem us. But obedience doesn't do that. Obedience is a response to the good that God has brought into our lives. It has nothing to do with earning. But people have collapsed the notion of anything active, uh, anything uh, even suggesting obedience with a work. And they've said, that can't fit with grace. That's a huge distortion mm. of divine grace just huge, and it's had such a damper on understanding what the good news is and how to receive it. And so I'm trying to revitalize the biblical notion of responding in obedience to God's will in the way that Jesus did. He talks explicitly about um, entering the kingdom only by doing the will of my Father. And that's obedience. And it's at the heart of what trusting God is. Um, and forgive me, I like uh, the, the mental, you know, kind of concrete uh, examples. And so what I think you're, you're talking about here is there's that obvious idea of someone gives you a task to do, and you do it and you get paid, right? That's what we think of as a job. 
And then I think uh, I right now my parents are out of town on vacation. We live in a multi-generational house. And my dad is paying the boys to watch the dogs. Um, they are somewhat responsible for the dogs. They're five and seven. Not very responsible, to be quite frank. We're the ones who are taking care of the dogs, right? But They're not getting the money. Right, right, exactly. I'm like, huh, how does... Anyways, um, but if you ask my son, did he work for that? Even though he's not really capable, he would say he worked for it. But even that, I think, is different from this idea of like someone... Uh, Let's say you're short on rent and uh, a family member co- like drives up to your house and says, hey, I have the money. Can you come out and get it, you know, for whatever reason? And you come out and you get the money and then someone's like, well, did you work for that? And you're like, well, I did walk outside and I took the money. So, yes, yes. I worked for it. And that seems that it, it seems to really destroy the, the whole sense of work there. Is that is it that does. a good example what we're talking about? It, it, is, it is. So it's your birthday today, suppose. And <laughs> you open your door and there's this massive gift sitting there right at the front door. Yeah. And you say, wait, I'm not going to open it because if I do, it's not a gift. It's something <laughs> that I've earned. No, wait a minute. Yeah. Receiving a gift can include, yes. shall we say, responding to it appropriately. Yes. And so when God intervenes in a human life, say through conscience with you know, leading me away from being too harsh to a sibling or rude uh, to a neighbor or whatever. When God leads me away from that in conscience and I respond with deeper obedience, that's not intended to earn anything. It's intended to cooperate with God in the goodness given as a gift, given as grace. There's no um, meriting or There's no conflict with grace there, but it is astonishing how many theologians, including New Testament theologians, stay away from that uh, important idea of voluntary uh, reception of a gift, cooperating with God, for fear that they might somehow curb or put a crimp on grace. It's just a conceptual confusion that I think has hindered large parts of the Christian church. Understandably. Um, And and then notice what falls out of this. If this has a role in faith, this kind of cooperation, obedience, then Jesus and Paul fit together perfectly. People have often wondered, well, what's with Jesus? He's all on about obedience, obeying, doing. But Paul, he's all on about faith or this, that. They fit perfectly because... There is something called the obedience of faith, where, and Paul uses that in Romans twice, the idea is that there's an inherent part of faith that is uh, cooperative with God. It says yes. And so Paul can even talk about obeying the gospel in Thessalonians. It's something to be obeyed. So when Jesus says, repent and believe in the good news in Mark to start his ministry, there's a call to obedience right there. But it's also a call to uh, faith as trust, trust in God, that this is good news. And so um, what we're getting then in Jesus is a kind of reinvigorating of the promise to Abraham, where it's through this kind of trust that God wants to bless all nations Mm. and all families. Absolutely. Uh, and you've talked a little bit about this God's, that God's righteousness, specifically in this guidance to our conscience, is evidence. Uh, what, are, what are the continuities, discontinuities between uh, your argument here and kind of the historical moral argument for God's existence? Yeah, the ho- historical moral argument is an argument. And see, I'm trying to get away from this idea that the way we come to God is by saying, okay, premise one, premise two, premise three, therefore, conclusion. I'm saying that's the wrong way to look at it. Instead, what happens is what I would call an interpersonal meeting, an interpersonal acquaintance. And that happens deep within conscience whenever we take conscience seriously. That's not an argument. It's one agent meeting another where God's nudging, God's prodding, God's gentle pressure 
Sometimes not quite so gentle, but you know, <laughs> it's not coercive. It's not coercive and can keep you up all night. But it, um, it's a place where one will meets another will. And that's more basic than any argument. Interpersonal acquaintance is what you might uh, invoke to support a premise, but it's not a premise. It's not an intellectual formation of a statement. And so the traditional arguments kind of keep God at arm's length. They say, here's my first premise. Here's my second premise. Now I'm going to draw a conclusion. Well, wait a minute. People aren't being acquainted with God when they're reflecting on the premises of an argument. They're thinking about statements and how an inference from the premises leads to the conclusion. Well, where's God? God isn't an argument. God isn't an inference. I'm trying to put the focus where I think the Apostle Paul put it, where I think Jesus put it before him, and where I think many of the prophets put it, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. They wanted direct acquaintance with God uh, of the kind uh, uh, akin to Moses. When, when Moses says in Exodus, God, show me your glory. And uh, God says, okay, uh, I'll give you a run at it. And then what happens? God shows God's goodness mm. to Moses. It's a remarkable passage. Moses wants the glory. And then God says, my goodness will pass by, which is a profound statement to identify the power and glory of God with the moral goodness of God. That's utterly profound, especially given a lot of theology uh, in ancient times. Well, and that's what John's gospel is trying to do too. Take the glory of God and put it in the self-sacrificing Jesus. You want to see the glory? Look at him on the cross. And it, it, it um, shall we say, shifts the terms of what it is to be divine glory. And so no argument needed here. Even a child could have that kind of acquaintance with God and say, you want an argument from me? Sorry, I can't give it. But that doesn't harm my evidence. My evidence is this interpersonal acquaintance that is ongoing in a life. And that's where the assurance comes by God continuing to display God's goodness if, if we're attentive to it. But we do have a role to play here. We are not mere pawns in some kind of chess game. And we see that, by the way, even in the book of Job, where God sends up, sets up a test. Believe it or not, God is the one who got Job into all that trouble. God <laughs> says, hey, uh, <laughs> Hey, deceiver. Hey, uh, my adversary, check out my uh, follower Job here and see what he's worth. And you want to say, don't do that, God. This is going to destroy Job. Yeah. And, you know, you don't want God to say that about you, just the adversary. Check out this. And so Job takes upon himself this um, reflection on, well, uh, things have gone from bad to worse. What's wrong with my life? And all of his friends have answers, you know, the answers philosophers would give. God eventually shows up and says, you know, shut up, guys. You don't know what you're talking about. And Job, Job meets God and says, you know, I've now seen God. I've now had an acquaintance with God. He doesn't mean visual seeing. And then he can say, uh, now I can trust him. Even if, even if I end up uh, destroyed in this, that's where uh, the biblical evidence for God wants to take us. Not to this, oh, do I have another refinement on this argument? It's where do I now stand face to face with God? If we don't take people there, they won't get the message. And that's why Jesus is so enigmatic. I mean, he doesn't come on the scene and just give you the standard, here, think about this. He's evasive. He's elusive. He's trying to get to the conscience of his audience where they will be struck by, oh, wait a minute. Maybe God is my father. Maybe God is, and now what? I think that's what Jesus wanted to do, and it's awfully hard to do. And look where it got him. <laughs> 
it, it may get you killed. <laughs> um, but the point is, he says um, that this is the way you pursue his father. And I think that's what um, the Sermon on the Mount is really about. Uh, how is it that you position yourself to respond to God? Uh, and Jesus seemed to call it purity of heart. And by that, he meant uh, sharing in God's goodness, because as he said, only God is good. Yeah. Um, thank you. And just a, a really beautiful summation um, of what we've been talking about so far. Uh, it definitely seems like, I think the attraction of the moral argument, uh, which is also its danger, is that it puts us in control, which is very much uh, antithetical to what we started with talking about um, God wants to exhibit good lordship, which you define as uh, leadership and uncoerced guidance. If you don't mind, I, I did want to ask... Where do you, uh, you've talked a little bit about seeing that in Psalms and Paul, but can you talk a little bit? Because I, I feel like, especially in philosophy, definitions are really important. And the idea of leadership as uncoerced guidance is defi definitely seems controversial. <laughs> can, so can you argue oh, for sure. that a little bit or at least discuss that a little bit? Yeah, um, there I have in mind uh, just the continuing theme throughout the Hebrew Bible that... Um, God is the one who leads us in paths of righteousness. Mm. Psalm 23. One of the most remarkable pieces of literature ever produced. And the profundity of it comes in that shift from the third person to the second person. Um, so God is the one uh, who uh, makes me lie down in green pastures, who leads me beside the still waters who restores my soul, leads me in paths of righteousness. But then what happens? Then what happens? Well, then, even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. Notice that shift to the second person. Something profound is happening there. And that's where uh, the desired guidance comes from. Not from, okay, give me the information book. Give me the instruction book, and I'll be okay, God. No, it's second person. Thou art with me. And the psalmist goes on to talk about God in the second person uh, until the end. And that is a profound shift that shows just the depth of that psalmist. And you get the same thing um, in Jesus, in the in the Lord's Prayer, right? Um, where you get um, thy kingdom come, mm. thy will be done. And guess where that comes from? Gethsemane. Because it's in Gethsemane where Jesus says, I really need a plan B here, Father. This is not looking good at all. And then shifts to, but, but your will be done, not mine. And so, the kind of guidance I'm talking about here is a uh, second person toward God and God speaking uh, to us in the second person. And the key with that kind of guidance is it's inherently rejectable. Indeed, even Jesus considered saying, uh, you know, this cross idea looked good and I've predicted it three times in the Gospel of Mark. But, you know, now that I'm on top of this, I don't really like this. You know, Jerusalem is not looking good at all uh, while his disciples had fallen asleep. Luke says he had been sweating blood uh, over this. He was so uh, frightened of what was coming. Um, but he resorts to this, I won't reject this. Mm. I won't. I will say your will first. And so if you take that away, that rejectable challenge from God, we become mere manipulated pawns. And that is not what we are portrayed to be by all the biblical injunctions. Consider all the commands, fear not, don't do, do this. We are not treated as uh, manipulated pawns. Mm. 
We are held accountable for how we respond. Abraham is praised for his response. Paul says in Romans 4, he didn't uh, cringe in uh, disobedience, but with resolve, he trusted God's promise. Uh, Jesus praises people for receiving uh, his word in the parable of the sower uh, in Mark's gospel to begin with. In Luke's gospel, it's explicit about the good heart of a person responding to the word. Um, Paul talks about it in Romans where God meets resistance but holds out his hands to a disobedient mm. and stubborn people. God is seeking for people to use their will to comply. And that's what a uh, voluntary response is to this kind of um, uncoerced, uncoerced guidance. Take that away, and you've got some uh, sham of a story uh, where there's coercion and none of it makes sense. Everything becomes just uh, unintelligible. So even as uh, I'm listening here and I'm thinking about your distinction between what you're doing here and the moral argument, I can't help but be struck by kind of the ongoing argument about what evil is between, for instance, Plato's definition that basically if people know the good, they will do the good. And then it's very clear in the Bible that like people know <laughs> the good and they choose not to do it anyways. Um, and so it, in some ways, it seems as you're talking about uh, becoming these pawns, these uh, uh, robots that the idea is, well, if we just knew to do good, we would do it. And really that element of choice is plays a central role here. What is, uh, you, you've talked quite a bit about will and choice and the conscience. What is the relationship between those two things? Yeah, I think there's an intimate relationship. And by the way, on the acrasia or weakness of will, I don't think Plato held that all his life. For one thing, we know that uh, Aristotle refuted the view Aristotle roundly rejected it. And in some of the later works, it seems that Plato has moved away from what may have been a Socratic view, that, that if you know the good, you'll do the good. Um, and as you know, in, in Romans 7, Paul just has none of that. I mean, oh, right, right. You know, the good that I would do, I don't. I mean, Paul is just clear that the knowledge can be in place, but the will need not be. Um, the interesting thing about conscience is that I think it's as interactive as a typical action so that I think that you can be presented with something in conscience and choose uh, to suppress it. Paul talks about suppressing or holding down the truth of God in Romans. And I think you can do that in conscience. You can, um, you can take what is suggested to you and either ignore it or outright oppose it. Um, and Paul then, in his references to the conscience, and there are several clear ones, uh, is urging people to pay attention to their conscience in a way that cooperates with God's spirit. Because he says that God's spirit can confirm things uh, through conscience. And so it's a place where we are still agents. Yes, mm. we can be um, interrupted uh, even at 3 a.m. with conscience, um, but we can respond uh, as we uh, see fit. And a lot of times, you know, I really would like to um, eat my vengeance cold and get my <laughs> uh, vengeance on somebody. And, and, you know, I can go against God's will for that. And I mean, shame on me when I do, but let's face the fact <laughs> that we are very good at telling stories to get around uh, the hard demands, especially when they involve things like enemy love. I love my enemy? Come on, let me get payback first, and then we'll talk about it. So I'm active even there. And that's because God has given, in prevenient grace, human agency. Hmm. God wants rapport with agents in God's image, not machines. Not something that God has simply caused to come about, uh, including in decisions. That isn't an interpersonal relation. That would be just an extension of God's own will. And so there's none of that in uh, Jesus or 
in Paul's uh, writing because they're loaded with injunctions to us to respond in a certain way and acknowledging that we can respond. Uh, and so we have to take that utterly seriously, I think, across the board, not just in ordinary action, but even in responding to conscience. Uh, and I hear you talking quite a bit about encounter, and you mentioned uh, Buber. I don't remember if you mentioned Levinas. Uh, how much do you take from them, and how much uh, of their influence is present? Yeah, very little from Aquinas. In fact, I'm sorry, um, Levinas. Apologies. Oh, oh Le Levinas. Levinas. Sorry. <laughs> Levinas. <laughs> oh, Levinas. No, yeah. no, no, no. I don't. Um, that 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 kind of language doesn't help me. Gotcha. When people talk about, you know, othering the other, and I. I don't, I, my view um, is by design steeped in the biblical narratives. Mm. And, and I have a strong preference uh, for Paul's understanding of Jesus, um, even over that of Hebrews, uh, because Paul has a view of self-sacrifice. The writer of Hebrews thought that uh, that had ended, and I, I think it's more complex than that. But um I think Paul has the most profound understanding of who Jesus is in the New Testament. And so I, I get my uh, views largely through Paul. Hmm. And I think he just sheds incredible light uh, on Jesus as well as on uh, the place of the Hebrew Bible, the place of the law. Um, I think Paul, even though he had never met Jesus bodily, uh, understood him with uh, unmatched depth. So yeah, I don't I don't look to any uh, contemporary philosophers uh, in this regard. Although I do have some favorites, and uh, most of my favorites um, are philosophical theologians who are long dead. And they, it's interesting; many of them come out of Scotland, like uh, P. T. Forsyth. I, I love his work. H. R. Macintosh. I love his work, um, and I think they just, um, John Bailey has done really remarkable work um, on the relation of ethics to God, uh, and some older work, in his book on uh, our knowledge of God. Um, so my favorites would come out of that tradition. The philosophers, I, th I think, I don't think they understand the biblical narratives adequately. I don't mm -hmm. think Aquinas did. I don't think Levinas did. Even Buber, um, I mean, Buber was a, obviously a scholar of the Hebrew Bible, but uh, I, I find him um, uh, almost too abstract and philosophical. And I don't think he takes the benefit of Jesus uh, into his account. Um, I think Heschel, Abraham Heschel, uh, moves a bit closer. Uh, but I think until you... Until you look at Jesus and Paul, you are at a real disadvantage in putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Thank you. That really, that helps a lot. And there's definitely, there's names that I had heard, but I've never read. So I will definitely uh, look those up later. Um, you mentioned earlier talking about loving your enemy, and that seems to be kind of a, a key thread throughout your book. Why is that the key thread in, in your argument about divine guidance? That's your right to perceive that. That's because that takes us to the heart of God's moral character. And what does mm. it mean? It means that God's love is unearned. I mean, if God can love God's enemies, I mean, you hardly say, oh, my enemy here who hates me uh, earns my love. No, on the contrary, <laughs> God's love is amazing because it extends to God's enemies. And Paul endorses this too in Romans 12, echoing uh, the Sermon on the Mount, or I don't know, echoing in, the, in a broad sense uh, because uh, Romans was written before Matthew, but Paul knew about this uh, through independent means. And um, what you have there is um, Jesus coming uh, to represent his Father, show us who God is, and to enact God's moral character through the cross and the resurrection, and in doing so, enacting God's enemy love. So mm. Paul can say in Romans, while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God through Jesus. And so we don't usually think of this, 
But that's the fact of the matter. When we respond to the good news, we are enemies of God responding to God's love. And so enemy love becomes hmm. the kind of love unique to God. I, I hate to be offensive, but you and I don't have that enemy love on our own. Hmm. I mean, just check out how you've treated your enemies throughout your life. And if we're honest, we're going to say, you know, at best, they're <laughs> second-class citizens in my world, if they're allowed <laughs> to be citizens at all. Um, and, you know, I share that. So when I hear about, you know, what Hitler did and our complicity in the Holocaust in the U.S., mm. It's just outrageous. It's outrageous how we treated the Jews. And we're supposed to f offer forgiveness? Mm. I mean, come on. That's mm. just crazy. And then people get all confused because they say, that means you don't challenge them. That means you condone evil. No, it doesn't. An offer of forgiveness is not uh, forgiveness received. That would require repentance. Will Hitler repent? I don't know. Don't ask me. But the point is, it looks as if some people won't because Jesus was willing to say it had been better if that man had not been born. Mm. So I aspire to universalism. I hope everybody's there at the party. But the evidence isn't too encouraging. It looks <laughs> as if some people are going to say, sorry, I don't need this. And I have a good friend who's very smart. Education is not his weakness. He says, look, if I find out I'm wrong at the end and that there really is a God, um, I'm just going to kill myself. I don't need this. I'm going to check out. And of course, I said, well, really? Are you serious? You finally get to the end. You see there's this good God who has your interests in mind. You're checking out? He says, yeah, because I really, I really don't want that kind of uh, shall I say, oversight on my life. And so I'm going mm. to kill myself. Now, is he wrong? Is he, he's not lying. That's his intention. I know that. But is he going to wake up at some point and say, I was a fool? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, mm. So I can't endorse universalism, but I aspire to it. And I think God does too. Yeah, and I, I think one that leads into a question I was just about to ask, but uh, this goes back to that non-coercive character, right? That yeah, like God could make these people, but that's not what he's looking for. He's looking for people to be in communion with. Um, and then what, but, what does the, these people ahead. mean then? They're no longer these right. people. In other words, hmm. they're no longer agents separate from God. They become right. cogs in God's gear. Right. They're just extensions of God's will. That's not, that's not rapport or fellowship. That is manipulation, and that depersonalizes. And that is not what's going on uh, if you read uh, the New Testament or e even uh, the Hebrew Bible, typically. That is not the story. Uh, I mean, what's this stuff about God holding out his hands all day long to a disobedient people? Paul is citing Isaiah there in Romans. Mm -hmm. And what's that about? I mean, is that just a farce? Is God playing games here? Uh, no, Paul meant it that, that, you know, the opponents of Jesus uh, got into trouble because of their unbelief, Paul says, not because God forced them. Romans mm -hmm. 9 is not about God forcing people not to believe in God. That's just unbelievable if you read Romans 10 and 11. God is seeking to bring in the Gentiles, and as a result, uh, the Jewish people who have a problem with Jesus. Mm. It's a press toward widening the tent, not narrowing it. And that, I think, uh, as you talk about these, you know, your friend who is... Um who would rather kill himself than be under any oversight, or you talk about Hitler, uh, you mention at the end, um, many theologians ignore the prominent theme of divine jealousy in their account of divine love. And I think, uh, can you speak to that a little bit as we, we talk about people who, as we talk about we, the lack of coercion, right? 
but then there's you have to deal with people who choose no. That's right. And that's a taboo topic too. Try to find somebody who deals forthrightly with divine jealousy. I think I cite four or five books where, you know, these big tomes on agape and love, not a peep on divine jealousy. Whereas the Old Testament, my name is jealous. His name is jealous. I mean, the, what's going on there? And uh, it's pretty clear that if you look at the, uh, the biblical discussion, God is not jealous uh, against me. God is jealous for me, for mm. righteousness on my behalf. And this is so very important because it explains why God not only allows havoc to be wrought in this world, but God himself wreaks havoc in many contexts. Isaiah says, God creates the unrest. The Hebrew word is sometimes translated evil. It's not to be translated evil in Isaiah there. It's God's creating a kind of uh, mess in the world to shake things up. And so I have this view of God as um, an agitator for righteousness. God agitates. And I think we've lost this idea of an active God who wreaks havoc in the world to shake things up for righteousness. And so I ask, well, where should we look for this uh, wreaking of havoc? And I'm saying, well, pretty much wherever you see it, because God is active trying to bring good out of the suffering, out of the bad that results, God is seeking redemption. And sometimes it comes only by resurrection, uh, sometimes prior to it. But this idea of jealousy, God isn't just good. God is bent on covering everything with God's goodness. God wants to paint it all with divine righteousness. And then, sorry to say, he wants to do it through us. And this is where the rub comes, because that means you and I must become the righteousness of God, Paul says, in Christ. We become God's righteousness. Well, that's no picnic, mm. given where we start from. And so there's this huge learning transforming curve where we have to be remade. And this is what uh, regeneration is about. Being remade, Paul would say, in the image of Christ, who's the perfect image of God. Well, that means a life of some travail and frustration. And so suffering becomes, get this for Paul, something we rejoice in. Now that just sounds s stupid. We rejoice in suffering. Mm. And Paul can step back and say, yes, because God's at work bringing good out of it. Fasten your seatbelts because there's going to be a bumpy road or two on the way. But this idea of jealousy for righteousness, if that's not front and center, we will never understand who God is and how this world might be God's world. If you don't have God working hard in a setting of free agents to paint it all with righteousness, it just doesn't make any sense. It seems like a big scam. I mean, why didn't God just flip the switch, you know, 10,000 years ago and clean it up? If God is, you know, bringing about things just by God's will, because it's cooperative, that's the very design. Why didn't God just wipe out Adam and Eve, but instead says, you know, you're going to have to leave the garden. I'm going to protect uh, the source of life, but you're going to have to learn some stuff. And so you could think of it as a massive, uh, institution for moral makeover, where our cooperation is vital. Take it out and nothing makes sense. And so, and so our big weakness becomes, we don't value righteousness the way God does. We don't take it seriously the way God. Now, we're, we're going to talk about love, and, and it's a remarkable. Notice how uh, Jesus doesn't talk about love really very much at all. I mean, he gives the love commands uh, in Mark's gospel. Here's the first command. Here's the second. Jesus is more bent on a kind of righteousness because 
God's righteousness includes love. It's righteous love. If you take away that qualifier, you get into big trouble because God becomes a kind of romantic cream puff. People get all romantic. And you want to say, stop that. That's not what God is like. God is holy. God is righteous. And out of that comes, and here's what agape is, goodwill for others. That's what agape is. But that goodwill comes out of God's righteous character and will. So we don't take jealousy seriously because we're kind of half-baked about righteous. Yeah, it'd be nice if things were righteous, but, you know, so what? Not really. We don't care. That wasn't the attitude of Jesus. He was burning with righteousness, and that's shown at his... Um, at the zeal for God's house, zeal. The, the Hebrew word for zealous is the same there um, in, the, in the original uh, use of it uh, in the Hebrew Bible as jealous. Zealous and jealous, they're the same word. And he shows that at the temple when he um, kicks out the um, salespeople, overturns the table, and they say, zeal for your house has consumed me. So what Jesus is doing is reflecting God's passionate righteousness. I don't think the church has that uh, today. I think it's lost it. I mm. think it's uh, I think it's uh, watered down, watered down uh, the conception of Yahweh and uh, Yahweh's Son uh, Jesus. I think I think that's been the big tragedy. Uh, and. As I'm sitting here, one of the, especially in our society, one of the first questions that comes to mind is, why can't God just leave me alone, right? And the answer is, is that it's better to live with God, and in this case, with righteousness, because you can't live with God without righteousness. The other answer, of course, is that you're only sustained, you're only created and sustained by God. That's also part of it. Um, but what, what comes to mind, even as you're talking about this, uh, that God is this agitator for righteousness, is uh, we see people who are not agitated for righteousness. And those are the people that uh, Christ actually tells us to, to pity. The, the rich man cannot be saved. Well, he says it is harder for him to be saved than a camel to go through the eye of a needle because they do not sense their lack. And that is what God is, in his jealousy, is calling us to. That's Am right. I tracking with words, you there? Yeah, I think, I, sorry, yeah, I should have asked. Indeed, Yeah. No, no, indeed. And, and notice, if you, if you were to ask Jesus, he would say there is no real life without um, righteousness. That would be losing your soul uh, mm. to gain the world. Right. And he's got this image of the only life worth living is the righteousness uh, of his father. And he is bent on showing this all the way up through Gethsemane. And I regard Gethsemane as his signature moment because mm. there he's telling us who he really is in relation to his father. I mean, in Gethsemane, it's Abba, Father. And then whose will is first? Well, I wanted it this way, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go for your righteousness and I'm going to display it to the world by this self-giving event in Jerusalem. This doesn't look good for me. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to uh, work out in detail. And so you can get the cry of dereliction in mm. Mark and Matthew, where, my God, my God, he's still my God. Uh, but, you know, what's going on here? Why have you abandoned me? And so he did feel abandoned. And we know that ultimately God didn't abandon him. He raised him and exalted him, Paul says in Philippians, uh, because of his obedience. Mm. Paul says because he has given up uh, his life at the cross. So I think the importance of um, righteousness as something we um, internalize, something we are defined by, is what Jesus is all about. I think that's what the new birth is all about, where God comes to people and works in their lives in such a way that they reflect who God is. And I think when that happens, um, 
you have a game changer because no longer is it about, am I listening to this law or that law? Am I following this ritual or that ritual? It's about who I am in relation to this God. But we'll never get there, I claim, mm. unless we stay in moral rapport. This is not a kind of, do these three steps, you've <laughs> succeeded, now you're there. No, it's more of a work in progress. And Paul talks about this when he asks whether uh, he has arrived. And it's in Philippians, no, of course not. He's an ongoing project. But it's in that moral rapport. That's where uh, the eternal life is. John's gospel even gets this when it says, this is eternal life to know you and the one you've sent. And to know you there, that means this interactive relationship. Until we put that front and center, I think we're missing the mark. Uh, and the only question becomes then, where should we look for real evidence that God is actually doing this stuff? Because so far you might say, well, you know, you've got a nice fairy tale there, but it really does float free of what I need to take it seriously. And I want to say, hmm. no, it doesn't. If you take the time to look within and see how your moral experience really is, in other words, shut up for a minute and pay attention, <laughs> you will see uh, this challenge to be convicted in conscience. And by the way, that's the promise uh, John's gospel gives uh, for the departure of Jesus. The Spirit will come and he will convict you of and that gives the list of righteousness. I mean, what's that about? Convict you of righteousness? It's about what we've been talking about. That um, this is how God brings God's own character into a human life. And so you don't need the arguments of the philosophers. You don't need all the abstract stuff. You need candor. And you need something like courage and loyalty to whatever goodness is presented to you. And even a child can have that. A 10-year-old mm. can have that kind of stuff. And so the philosophers become just a kind of afterthought. Let them write their tomes. Let them go off onto these various paths. That isn't where the action is. Because that isn't where the Spirit of God is working in conscience. Dr. Moser, I can't think of a better way to finish today. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute joy having you on today. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, PJ. 